Hi, everyone. Again, I'm still Dagmar Salazar with the NIDA CTN's Clinical Coordinating Center. And today I'll be speaking on how to develop an effective site-specific standard operating procedure, SOP for short, um, for research staff engagement with participants lost to incarceration post-study enrollment. All right, so briefly, just wanted to um, share today's outline for the presentation. Um, I will be discussing the importance of an SOP, distinguishing between a MOP, a manual of operations, versus an SOP, considering the benefits for implementing a site-specific SOP for prisoner engagement at research sites, um, also outlining the components of an effective site-specific SOP for prisoner engagement, and then finally, discussing the general process of SOP development and, of course, sharing some tips, lessons learned. So I can already hear the chatter. Um, some of you already may be like, comparing notes with your colleagues. Um, you know, what is the difference between a manual of operations, often referred to as a study MOP, and a standard operating procedure, often referred to as an SOP? Well, we'll cover that right now. <laughs> Okay, so a simple way of defining what a MOP, a study MOP is, is that it is a handbook that details or outlines procedures for study conduct and operations written such that the content can be applied across multiple sites, such as for our multi-site trials. A simple way of defining what an SOP is that it is a detailed written instructions that are specific to a site for the performance of a specific function or a specific procedure to achieve uniformity. So again, just these basic definitions to just get us started with our discussion. Continuing on with defining what an SOP is, some considerations and some considerations for why SOPs are needed within the context of clinical research include that an SOP is an effective tool to centralize guidelines and standards for a specific procedure. It can help minimize risk, and it can help um, effectively help to maintain consistency in performing the procedure among different study staff members, for example. The next slide provides examples of the benefits SOPs impart on a trial that do, in fact, make it an effective tool. All right, so an SOP, how is it effective or what really makes it effective? Well, um, it does increase compliance with the study protocol. It does so by minimizing or helping to minimize protocol departures or deviations, which we are not a fan favorite, which is not a fan favorite to have to report. And because the information is written and incorporated and is specific to the site, an SOP is effective in reinforcing knowledge of the procedure performance even after completing study-wide training. It ensures effective coverage by research staff over the course of a study, and it also encourages quality control that is subject to routine evaluation. So with this next slide, I wanted to um, just list a couple of examples of SOP topics that have been implemented on NIDA CTN trials. So some examples include topics surrounding retention procedures, for example, participant tracking, prisoner assessment, prisoner engagement, the topic for this presentation, follow-up and compensation. Topics surrounding participant safety, for example, psychiatric and medical emergencies, and also topics surrounding other study procedures, including collecting informed consent, biological assessments, or medical record abstraction. So now I will be transitioning the discussion into reviewing the elements sites should consider, including when developing a site-specific SOP for prisoner engagement. The list of elements I will review is certainly not an exhaustive list. However, these are the elements that I have seen included within the SOPs developed by sites that have shown success in engage, helping um, research staff members engage with participants who have become incarcerated. All right, so what are they? To start off, an SOP should include a statement describing the purpose or rationale for the SOP, 
and this will help to orient the reader as to the content of the SOP. So what I have on this screen is an example of a um, purpose. Um, it's very simple. It could be simple, simply stated as this SOP is a site-specific supplement outlining gu guidelines on procedures for locating and completing follow-up visits with incarcerated participants. Another element to include is information and guidance on how to locate an incarcerated individual. For example, this section of the SOP can describe um, specific navigation strategies, such as using the locator form to get the full name of the participant and any alternative spellings, or even location the participant frequents to perhaps help narrow the search. Within this section, it will be useful to incorporate a list of the different search databases, whether at the county or city level, or even state resources or federal resources to use to assess if the participant has been incarcerated. Further, whether embedded in this section or in another section, another element to consider is listing out the contact numbers for facilities, describing steps, and instructions for how to contact the facilities and or how to inquire about the participant while maintaining participant confidentiality. As Sarah noted, it's very, very important and required um, per the regulatory approvals. So I won't spend too much time describing um, further um, because Amber, our next presenter, will be covering how to apply these and other strategies for locating incarcerated participants in this CPAN webinar series. So um, information about how research staff should contact a participant is another important element to consider incorporating in the site-specific SOP. The lead team as well as the local study research team will need to determine if any internal approvals, for example, are required to obtain before research staff initiate contact with the participant. If so, this information should be included with specification about the acceptable approval method and storage. So for example, is an email okay to get an approval via email or is a progress note um, the preferred method to document the approval? Further, research study staff should discuss if, if in-person study visits at a facility should be conducted on certain days of the week or does scheduling depend on other fact factors? So for example, um, do research staff need to ensure that there's backup coverage at the local site um, similarly, would, would it be good to outline the same for setting up a visit by phone? Um, and when scheduling by phone, you know, determining, you know, are there certain times during the day that are more favorable or, you know, even maybe providing an estimate of how much time should be allotted or can be allotted for the phone visit, depending on the facility or what's going on at the research site. Along the lines of setting up the study visit, either in person or by phone, information about how to prepare for the visit would be valuable to include. Examples include how to navigate how to navigate to the in-person visit and or guidelines for proper or acceptable identification. Research, would, research staff would benefit from reviewing any facility-specific requirements or rules, um, certain procedures that they need to comply with before or upon approval, as well as for facility departure. It would also be appropriate to include this information in the SOP and have research staff review prior to traveling to the facility, um, prior to conducting the study visit. The following um, elements listed cover aspects surrounding the conduct of the, the last ones in this slide cover um, what materials to take um, with you, uh, including identifying the study materials that are appropriate and required to take for completing the study. For example, um, study materials to take would include specific blank case report forms and also would be good to indicate if there are certain materials that should not be taken. For example, materials containing the participant's personal health information, such as the locator form. Another aspect um, that 
does deserve some consideration is that research teams will need to assess how to determine acceptable methods for transferring participant study compensation and how this transfer should be documented. And finally, not to be taken lightly at all, an element describing safety should be strongly considered for inclusion. Safety information to include ranges from how to handle psych psychiatric versus medical events. For example, are there procedures to follow within the facility that research staff should know about? And any relevant research staff precautionary measures. You know, is a buddy system required for conducting these in-person study visits at the facility? So I won't go into much further um, with describing, um, but Peter, in our last presentation, will provide um, information on how to conduct an in-person study visit, and will also describe how the information from the SOP helps with coordination of the study visit. All right. So now that we've reviewed and described some of the SOP elements that should be considered for inclusion in the SOP for preserve engagement, we'll move into reviewing some general strategies for developing an effective SOP. And actually, they're listed here on the slide. So typically, the SOP development process is a collaborative effort among several different study team members. For example, the team may be comprised of team members from the LEAP node, the CCC, Clinical Coordinating Center, and research site staff. So how might you, might, you may be asking how and, you know, how is this coordinated? Um, for starters, during study pre-implementation, the lead team, or it's beneficial if the lead team helps to identify which procedures would benefit from requiring a site-specific SOP and establish ob objectives and standards to include within the SOP. As part of the site readiness activities, site staff work together in developing the SOP to ensure the content is complete, useful, and accepted. The LEAP node and with the assistance of the Clinical Coordinating Center Protocol Specialist um, may choose to review, may review the SOP to offer comments, provide edits, ensure uniformity and compliance with the study protocol, and also to provide final approval. A note I did want to make mention here is that SOPs are subject to revision during the life of the study. And so with each revision, applying this review process is important prior to implementation. So now I wanted to wrap up this presentation by providing a few tips to keep in mind when developing a site-specific SOP as listed on this slide. The first is don't be shy. Consult with researchers familiar with the process. It's not uncommon that some lead nodes and site staff will approve their SOPs to be shared with other, other study team members to facilitate the development of their site-specific SOP. Remember, developing is best done with a collaborative approach. Another tip, making sure to use consistent study terms and language. Um, so definitely reference the protocol and or the study MOP to pull this um, language and, and terms. Um, on NIA CPN trials, um, just a reminder, the preference is to refer to the patients that are participating on our trials as participants and not subject. So making sure not to make use of subject as a way to describe or refer to the participants um, in the study. In terms of referring to research study roles, just making sure that you are utilizing the research study rules that have been identified and written into the study protocol. So some protocols um, include research assistant, study coordinator, PI, et cetera. So just being mindful to make sure to refer to the study protocol to identify those research study rules. It's not uncommon, especially these days, um, to use acronyms, and it's perfectly fine to include include acronyms in the SOP, but making sure that you have defined any acronyms that have been um, utilized and incorporated in SOP. Of course, verify content is free from any contradictions to existing study procedures. And this, of course, is with the aim to avoid introducing any sort of protocol, um, protocol deviations. 
All right, um, setting aside time to review SOPs with all site research staff prior to implementation, making sure to go through the review process um, before they are implemented. And then finally, revise SOPs as needed. Again, these are working documents and are subject to edits once they are implemented. All right, so that wraps up what I wanted to present to you. If you have any questions, my contact information is listed on the screen. Um, feel free to contact me with any questions um, and look forward to any comments um, as well.